When I was a kid, I've always wondered if there was any structure beneath the disorderly feeling of learning biology. I wondered if there was any logic in the ways that life grows, behaves, and responds to the world around it. Another thing I've learned is that every cell in your body shares the same source code, the same DNA, the same genome, yet your brain cells and your skin cells behave and look completely different. Why is that? These questions inspired my younger self to dig deep and make sense of this great natural mystery. And today, my goal is to show you that this beautiful and complex nature of biology isn't just explainable through math, but I will be showing you a really counterintuitive program in biology that is only fully explainable through the lens of mathematics. And before we begin, I'd really appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe. It gives you even more feel to keep pushing hard and make more of these videos. But without further ado, let's get started. So I want to recap a little bit of last video's content as it's going to be the core of this video moving forwards. You might want to go back to that one since we're going to be relying on a lot of content in terms covered in that video. The information of life flows from DNA to RNA to protein. But what I did not touch upon last video is that how do you tell the cell that you actually need that protein, that specific protein? It can't waste its resources in something it doesn't need. In other words, how do you call forth a function in biology, much like in code? And to answer that question, the genome, the OS of living things, doesn't just contain the blueprints for the functions, but it also encodes the dials, the knobs, and pretty much a fully-fledged control system that can turn on and off and precisely control the amounts of proteins being produced. Here's the very basic syntax of it all. To start transcribing DNA into RNA, the transcriber, RNA polymerase, has to first latch on to a landing pad known as a promoter. Once it latches on, then it can go on and transcribe whatever is in its way until it reaches a metaphorical stop sign known as a terminator. Whatever is in between the promoter and the terminator gets transcribed into messenger RNA. And here's where the fun begins. You can actually control how often the RNA polymerase binds onto the promoter by adding another stretch of DNA called an operator. This is a landing pad for a molecule known as a repressor. Most likely it's a protein. What a repressor does is that it's like a bouncer at a bar that prevents RNA polymerase from joining the party. As you can see in this animation, the operator latches onto the DNA and blocks the RNA polymerase from transcribing. But when a signal, in this case lactose, binds to the repressor, it lets go of the DNA. This is basically a switch. Another cool example of controlling transcription is the building material of our chromosomes. It physically blocks RNA polymerase by having DNA wrapped tightly around it. Instead of just lowering transcription rates, you can also increase the transcription rates using molecules called activators that allow RNA polymerase to anchor on more stably. And this is the start of decision making in living things. Given an input, you can change how much protein is being produced just like a knob in an analog system. And if you wire enough of them together, you can create complex logical systems that end up being able to decide the fate of cells. This is basically what makes nerve cells different from skin cells, despite sharing the same source code. And the rest of this series is going to be dedicated to understanding all the different types of control structures and unveiling their nature through mathematics. But this episode will focus on the simplest, negative autoregulation, or NAR. I'll be using these interchangeably. So here is how this motif works. You create a protein using what we've seen before, but the catch is that this protein is a type of repressor and it comes back to repress its own production. But wait, why would you ever want it to do that? That seems pretty useless and counterintuitive. Wouldn't just letting it go without repressing anything be more productive for the cell overall? Yet this motif is found in the controls for some of the most important functions, such as the synthesis of the Lego bricks that are used to build proteins. So if Looking at it from a biological point of view doesn't work, 
we should turn to our old friend, mathematics. The goal of the cell is to be able to control how much protein it makes precisely. If it makes too much of it, it consumes resources and it can be lethal, make too little and it can't perform its function properly. Another thing is that ideally it want to have a fast production so it can quickly respond to the environment. So before we go look at NAR, let's take a look at what happens without it being there. This is just the central dogma model we've seen last video. You might have noticed two things about this model. The amount of protein reaches a certain value, a so-called steady state. If we plot the mRNA and protein amount, you can see that it's roughly just a multiple of each other. So before moving on, let's simplify the whole central dogma model and pretend the process of mRNA to protein is just a simple constant multiplication. And we'll rename the mRNA production constant as B and the degradation as A. Higher B means faster production and higher A means faster degradation. And when we simplify all of that, we have a much simpler model that we can deal with. This type of model, by the way, is called a lumped model. We lump a bunch of components together to make a computation that's much cleaner and much faster. This is especially important if you're going to be dealing with even more complex systems that will await you in biology. We will open that can of worms that is RNA to protein once we need to get into control structures of RNA itself. But for now, our lumped model suffices. So if we play the game of separating, integrating, we find that as time passes, the concentration approaches B over A. This is the explicit form of our steady state. But let's say this is a little too slow for our cells liking and we want it to reach the steady state faster. Well, you can ramp the production rate B up since that's the production constant. And while that actually goes faster, it creates a paradox, a problem if you may, because it actually pushes the steady state to higher values. Problem is that this could be potentially toxic and waste too many resources. So this is where negative autoregulation comes in. Let's start off with our old OD. The information we need to add is that the rate of production is going to be controlled by how much of X there is the protein repressor X there is, so more of X means less of transcription. We model this using something called a Hill function, and here's how it works. As you can see, if we increase the amount of protein X, the rate of production becomes less and less. Changing B will change the max rate of production, increasing N makes the whole function look more step-like, and K moves around the center of the function. So for simplicity's sake, let's make n equals 1. You're welcome to try and pause and solve this on your own, but when we solve it, this is what we find. The NAR reaches the target level much faster than simple regulation. Here's another way to look at it. If we look at the rate of production versus the rate of degradation, the intersection between the two is where our steady state is going to be. This type of plot is called a rate plot, by the way. And the gap between them is going to tell you how fast the rate of production at that point is. And as you can see, at the same given point, the simple regulation just doesn't have the same juice compared to NAR. There's even more that we can dig out of this rate plot. The degradation factor, A, isn't as constant as I may have made it seem. This factor varies based on cell size and what type of organ it has been working with, cell dilution, and so on and so forth. It has a pretty decent chance of varying, that's all I'm saying. And as you can see, I, if I vary A by the same amount, you can see that the NAR has a much better time dealing with the change in steady state compared to our simple regulation. This motif is super robust. And let me just remind you that if we were to just use biological inspection alone, we'd still be mauling over the same problem in the loop. Our insights about the usefulness of this motif only came about because of the use of mathematics. Not only that, but the math allows us to be able to mimic nature and engineer this motif into future genetic engineering projects. 
Next time, we'll get to even more advanced biology, programming, decision making, and timing in biology. So don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for getting me to a thousand subs. Goodbye.